How to Treat Inguinal Hernia Without Surgery, Part 5. Chapter 5 of the Reducible Inguinal Hernia and Use of Trusses. Hernia are found in the three following conditions, reducible, irreducible, and strangulated. The reducible is that state in which the protruded parts may be returned into the cavity of the abdomen, and, as it is attended with no immediate danger to the patient, frequently induces, in his mind, a false idea of security. A person under these circumstances lives in continual danger, as numerous accidental causes may produce strangulation of the prolapsed intestine, the consequence of which will be fatal unless early and well-directed skill be employed. To prevent this accident, a constant pressure should be applied at the part where the hernia opens into the abdomen to close the mouth of the sac and thus oppose an effectual resistance to the protrusion of its contents. For this purpose, bandages of different kinds and elastic trusses have been invented. But generally, the instrument that can be most safely relied on is a truss of steel. Other bandages often afford only a false security, more dangerous even than a total omission of this kind of support, since they encourage the patient to take violent exercise without apprehension of the probable consequences. An elastic steel truss, if properly made and well applied, ensures the security of the patient during any degree of moderate exercise, and is no hindrance to any of the common occupations of life. The pad of a steel truss is composed of a supporting piece of iron, and stuffed so as to take a form on the one hand not too conical, and on the other not too flat. The former occasions pain by an unnecessary degree of pressure, while the latter does not affect the purpose of preventing protrusion. The pad is riveted upon a long flat piece of steel, tempered to a great degree of elasticity, and curved to the shape of the lower part of the body, which it embraces like a belt. The length of this steel should be sufficient to pass from the hernia round the region of the groin to about an inch beyond the spine behind, forming somewhat more than a semicircle, but compressed. Both the pad and truss are quilted with leather. A strap of leather proceeds from the hinder end of the truss, which passes round the opposite side of the body, completing the circular belt by fastening upon the pad. An understrap is sometimes added, which passes down from the back part of the truss between the patient's thighs and is brought up to the fore part of the pad, to which it is fastened by a stud. This prevents the truss slipping upward. However, if the pelvis is well formed, that is, studding outwards, or the abdomen is large, this understrap is not necessary. But when the pelvis inclines towards the abdomen, the truss will slip from its proper position unless retained by this strap. Many surgeons, and almost every surgeon's instrument maker, have thought proper to vary the form of the truss, and to prescribe different rules for the direction and force of the pressure. But almost all were formally agreed in determining that the pressure should be made upon the external abdominal ring. This is precisely the circumstance, however, in which they were all defective, and indeed it is the frequent failure of the purpose for which they are designed, when made according to this principle, that has led to such variety in the mode of their construction. The object in applying a truss is to close the mouth of the hernial sac and destroy its communication with the abdomen. And this object can never be perfectly fulfilled by any truss which is applied upon the external abdominal ring and extending from it upon the os pubis. In this case, the cure must be incomplete, because a considerable portion of the hernial sac remains uncompressed towards the abdomen, which portion is that situated between the abdominal ring and the opening of the sac into the cavity of the belly. In plate fifth will be seen a hernial sac closed opposite to the abdominal ring, but still open to the abdomen above and outwards. In the same plate is another sac imperfectly closed from the same cause. This sac has several partitions in it, dividing it into cells, the formation of which is to be explained in the following manner. The patient first applies his truss to the abdominal ring, which after being worn for a time, shuts or contracts the sac at this part, and the patient, thinking himself cured, leaves off the bandage. The sac, however, being still open higher up towards the abdomen, though closed at the external ring, the hernia again protrudes, and the truss is resumed. But being still applied upon the external ring, only a partial cure is a second time produced, and the cause of the disease remains as before. Nor is this all the mischief that attends this practice. 
for the pressure of the spermatic cord by the truss against the os pubis frequently occasions great pain, to relieve which the patient is constantly shifting its situation and destroying its effect, and often the testes themselves become wasted by the interruption of the passage of the blood along the spermatic vessels. The proper method of completely obliterating the mouth of the hernial sac is to apply the truss, not only on the external abdominal ring, but also on the aperture at which the spermatic cord, and with it the hernia, first quit the abdomen. For the descent of a hernia cannot be entirely prevented, or a cure be affected, but by making pressure on the internal abdominal aperture and on the inguinal canal. The effect of wearing a truss on this part is to approximate the sides of the mouth of the sac, and thus to prevent any future descent into the same cavity. If the pressure be long continued, adhesion takes place at the orifice of the sac, and interrupts the communication between the abdomen and the cavity of the sac, which, being no longer distended by the descent of any viscous, contracts in dimensions, and at length in some cases becomes entirely obliterated. Footnote. The well-ascertained fact of small hernial sacs being readily returned into the abdomen proves the propriety of applying trusses, while the cellular membrane connecting the cremaster and sac preserves that capability of distension, which after a long continuance of the sac in the scrotum, it ceases to have. A small and recently formed hernia is cured by a different process from that required in the cure of a large and old sac. In the latter, the gut can only be permanently prevented descending by adhesion taking place between the sides of the mouth of the sac, whereas a small hernia is cured by giving firmness to the cellular texture surrounding the neck of the sac, and thus preventing the elongated peritoneum descending through the internal abdominal ring. Ed. End of footnote. In plate 6 is shown the mode of applying the truss so as to ensure the most favourable effect, the pressure being here exerted on the whole length of the inguinal canal. Therefore, when a hernia has been returned by the surgeon into the abdomen, he should lay his fingers obliquely above and to the iliac side of the ring, and direct his patient to cough. And the furthest part from the ring towards the spine of the ilium, where the hernial sac is felt to protrude, is the point which should be noted for the application of the pad of the truss, and the instrument made accordingly. Measurement is taken for making the truss by laying one end of a piece of string upon this spot, and carrying the other round the pelvis, midway between the trochanter major and spine of the ilium, till it meets the fixed point at first determined, and completes the circle. This is the proper length for the truss. In the above manner, I have been in the habit of measuring persons for trusses, expecting when the hips have projected unusually, when it is advisable to substitute for the string a piece of iron wire, which, by retaining the precise outline of the patient's hip, serves as a necessary direction for the instrument maker to copy. It will be found that the pad of the truss must be applied proportionally nearer to the abdominal ring in large than in small hernia. When the protrusion is small, the pad may be fixed midway between the symphysis pubis and the spine of the ilium. But as the dimensions of the hernia increase, the mouth of the sac moves gradually nearer the abdominal ring, and the artificial pressure must, in some degree, be regulated accordingly. Always remembering, however, that the truss should never be brought upon the pubis, as a pressure on the outer and upper part of the ring will still be sufficient to keep the viscera within the abdomen. It happens, not unfrequently, that hernia appears on both sides of the body. When this takes place, a double truss or one with two pads and strings must be worn, made of materials similar to the single truss. To make them sit easy and fit properly, they should buckle behind and be made longer or shorter at pleasure. This is done by constructing them in such a manner that one spring will readily slide upon the other. The principle of application and the degree of pressure required are to be regulated as the single trusses. As it is often an object of importance for the patient to use the bath whilst wearing a truss, I have directed the spring to be covered with oil skin, for the patient should on no account remove it at the time he is making so considerable an exertion as that of swimming. A truss, when first applied, produces some uncomfortable feelings for about a week after which they wear off unless the force of pressure is unnecessarily great, in which case the spring must be weakened, as it frequently brings on inflammation of the testicle. On the contrary, if the hernia ever comes down whilst the truss is properly applied, a stronger spring must be provided. 
The best-made truss will chafe at first, however well put on, but this inconvenience of a few days may be lessened by interposing a piece of linen between the pad and the skin, which generally puts a stop to the uneasy chafing. It is usual for the patient to inquire how long his truss must be worn. This is difficult to be determined. I have known a hernia completely cured by wearing a truss only nine months, and instances are not at all uncommon of the truss being left off at the end of the year without any relapse of the complaint. But I would, at all event, advise it to be worn at least two years, even by young persons, in whom alone the complaint is curable by this method. As to elderly persons, they must continue to wear it for the remainder of life, for in them there is no probability of much change taking place in the mouth of the sack. I have never known them long omit its use without experiencing some relapse. During growth, parts will readily accommodate themselves to pressure, extending or diminishing according to circumstances, but in adults and in the old, this process is much more tardy. The truss should be worn even during the night, lest any unexpected occasion should call the patient from bed unprepared for the sudden change of posture. For if the hernia once descends during the wearing of the truss, the cure must be considered as recommencing from that moment. A patient should be provided with two trusses in order to guard against the effects of accident, which may render one useless, and he will also experience great comfort in changing his night truss before he rises in the morning. A hernia will sometimes remain apparently cured for a considerable time and return on some sudden exertion. This arises from the adhesions at the orifice of the sac being imperfect and yielding to the pressure of the viscera. A gentleman, aged 25, applied to me with a return of a left inguinal hernia, which had originally appeared at the age of seven years. He had worn a truss for it till within two years of its second descent, a period of sixteen years and during the last two years had remained free from any descent of his rupture. A hernia that thus reappears is much more liable to incarceration than a recent hernia, on account of the thickening produced in the neck of the sac by the pressure of the truss, which also renders the replacement of the protruded intestine a work of greater difficulty. There is one circumstance which will always render a prudent surgeon guarded in promising a complete cure of hernia from wearing a truss. It is that although the original sac may be completely shut at its mouth by adhesion or perfect contraction, it is possible that another sac may be formed contiguous to the first. An instance of this may be seen in plate fifth. In this case, two hernial sacs are found side by side, one open and capable of containing the bowels when protruded, the other contracted so much as not to admit a goose's quill. In the latter, therefore, the disease was cured, but remained in the former. A similar instance of a second descent is seen in plate 8, figure 1, and another example of the same kind will be mentioned hereafter. Steel trusses are equally applicable to infants as to the adult. Indeed, less unequal pressure is made by them than by common inelastic bandages applied round the pelvis. The scrotum of an infant should be carefully examined to ascertain whether the testicle has descended through the external ring, as the non-descent of the testicle forbids the application of a truss. The sac, in such cases, is formed by the elongation of the tunica vaginalis, and any pressure made upon it will necessarily prevent the testicle descending into the scrotum. The application of a truss should therefore be deferred until the testis has fairly descended below the external ring. The nature of this hernia will be described under the subject of hernia congenita. When a hernia has been cured by adhesion, as the peritoneum, which forms the sac, is a secreting membrane, an accumulation of water sometimes collects in it, forming a species of hydrocele, an instance of which is represented in plate fifth. The treatment of this disease should be similar to that of hydrocele from other causes. During the application of a truss, it is proper that every part of the protruded content should be carefully returned, so that no compression be made on them, and if the patient should find that any part has again descended, he should place himself in a recumbent posture, take off the truss, push back the hernia with his hand, and again apply the truss. A person obliged to use a truss who allows of the descent of a portion of the hernia whilst this instrument is worn is in greater danger of strangulation of the part than if he wore no truss at all. For when unprotected by this bandage, he always feels his danger and is ready to guard against it. But a bad truss gives the idea of security without ensuring its reality. 
When it is clearly ascertained that adhesion of the neck of the sack is affected, the use of the truss may be discontinued. But as this will generally be a matter of uncertainty, great caution must be used before the truss is laid aside. At first, the patient may discontinue it at night, taking care to replace it before he rises from bed. He may afterwards remove it when he is not called upon to make any violent exertion. But before it is wholly laid aside, the surgeon should make a particular examination of the abdominal rings to ascertain if on coughing or other sudden action of the abdominal muscles any descent or tendency to protrusion exist at the internal ring. A description of the best constructed trusses is given with the plate.